This is the BBC. On the 20th of August, 1976, a mother of two walked out of a factory. She'd had enough of the humiliation and intolerable conditions she was working under. On leaving, she said to the manager, What you run here is not a factory, it's a zoo. There are monkeys here who dance to your tune, but there are also lions here who can bite your head off. And we are the lions, Mr Manager. I want my freedom. And there began a two-year strike at Grunwick Film Processing Factory in northwest London, where the majority of the workers were migrant Indian women. They became known as the Strikers in Saris. Leading them was Jaya Ben Desai, today's great life choice of stand-up comedian, CNN commentator and columnist for the London Evening Standard and a former Labour advisor, Aisha Hazarika, MBE. Aisha, I remember the Grunwick strike in 1976, but I'd forgotten the name of the woman who led it. That may be significant. Do you think she's forgotten by most people? I think she's definitely a big figure, a small figure, only four foot ten, but really hidden from history. And I think she had had huge courage. You know, you read that fantastic Mm. quote. She stood up against authority figures at Grunwick, at the factory, against the government, against the police and against the trade union movement. And these are all quite authoritarian bastions of power in society. They're white, they're male, they're macho. Now, the things she's done, that would be impressive, even if it was a a white man doing it. But to think of this Indian immigrant mum doing it, to me, I just think that's absolutely extraordinary because, again, they are considered to be docile and meek. And in a way, that's why they were employed by that factory because they thought they could wring out a lot of work from these types of women. They would never complain, they would never put up with anything. So I think she's a fantastic role model. She's a great inspiration and will be a great inspiration to so many other women of colour because there aren't that many women of colour in the sort of annals of history and the stories. The stories that get written up about the trade union movement, about politics, tend to be white men. They're not we women in saris. How did you first come across her? I mean, you must have been about one during the Grunwick strike, mustn't you? I definitely don't remember anything (laughs) from the time. But when I worked for the Labour Party and the Labour movement, my speciality was women and equality issues. And I was particularly interested in the trade union movement as well. And I got to know her because of an MP, he's now an MP called Jack Dromey, who played a very big part in her strike. He was uh, one of the advisors in Brent and she went to him for help. So he educated me about her. Let's get down then to her story and and to help, let's bring into the discussion our expert witness, who's Dr Sundari Anita, co-author of Striking Women, who lectures at the University of Lincoln. Anita, in a nutshell, what was the strike about? The strike was about poor working conditions and the lack of respect with which the migrant women workers at Grunwick were treated. So it was a strike about dignity and race because the women were employed at Grunwick and chosen for that job because they were migrant workers and the factory owner felt that they would be easy to exploit. And how were they being exploited? In many ways, their wages were much lower than other comparable factories processing photographs at the same time. But more particularly, the workers were subjected to very oppressive conditions at work. So the management control was very high. The women workers had to ask for permission to go to the toilets. Good and, Lord. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine that? And Jahab and Desai, in fact, mentioned that at the toilets, the women would come together and complain to her. And later, some of the women would say that, I feel ashamed to put my hand up and ask loudly for permission. And Jahab and Desai turned to them and said, he's trying to make you feel ashamed. Why should you feel ashamed? put your hand up and learn how to say it in English and ask loudly. Turn the shame back on him. So these were the conditions the workers were living with day after day. Can I go back momentarily to the uh, trade unions? They treated her badly in the end. Did did they hijack the strike and, and then let the workers down? 
I think they did. So in many ways, the strike wouldn't have acquired the profile it did if the trade unions had not supported her. And I'll come back to what you were saying, Aisha, about South Asian women being perceived as meek and submissive. This wasn't the first time South Asian women had taken part in a strike or tried to challenge unequal conditions at work. What was unique was that this was the first time trade unions supported migrant women workers in their struggle. And that was the turning point here. And that's why it became such a big dispute. Did you meet her, Anita, ever? I did, yeah, in 2007 and subsequently several times over the next few years. And that always struck me. She was a very a small a woman, but when she started talking about the dispute, she would become very animated and as she had a very sharp mind. She was indomitable. Mm. You're right to challenge me about this um, perception about Indian women being meek because anybody who knows... Indian mothers, they're definitely not meek. They're the, like, toughest people around. Not, not, not at home, but, <laughs> but perhaps professionally she did need to break yeah. the mould. But I think the overall narrative is that these immigrant women, it wasn't the weak, it's they had no power. That's the thing, isn't it? They had no power in their workplace. And, you know, what were they going to do? What were they going to do? Walk out? And then she'd cross that line. She was like, yeah, I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm walking out. Let's hear her talking about that. I didn't stand in front of injustice, never. So when it came to me, I told, look, this is not the situation for me to work. When and why, Anita, did she start working at Grunwick? She was in East Africa and following Africanisation policies, she felt the future of her children wasn't secure there. And holding British passport, she eventually came to the UK to make a better life for herself. She and her family encountered a lot of racism in the housing market and felt that they had to own their own home because it was very difficult for uh, Asian people, black people to rent in those days. And that was the imperative for joining the labour market. She'd never worked formally outside the home and particularly in a factory. That would be unthinkable for someone from her class and status. They were quite professional people, weren't they? Her husband had been a, a manager in Africa. And that was not unusual for a lot of East African Asians who went to countries in Africa during the colonial rule because they were the middling class. Yes, I I was born and brought up in sub-Saharan Africa. And and you're right, there was a kind of special status halfway in a way between the whites and the black Africans. And that really played out. That was really important in the Grunwick dispute because she was not used to being treated like other migrant workers were expected to put up, conditions that the migrant workers were expected to put Mm. up with because of her previous social position. And therefore, she acutely felt the disrespect that she encountered at work and felt she had to challenge that. Now, her employer was Anglo-Indian himself, George Ward. Is is that right, Aisha? Yes, and I think in a way that also played into the fact that he seemed to actively seek these migrant Indian women to come and and work for him because I think he also had a sense that again it's another cliche but I think that's how it was seen you know these women would work very very hard they had a strong work ethic and they would be well behaved they wouldn't be difficult to manage. What do we know about her family her parents? She was born in a small village in Gujarat she was born in 1933 and after the death of her younger brother they moved to Bombay When she talks about her childhood, she says she flew kites with her brothers and she was allowed to do things that other girls in her village weren't allowed to do. Jaya Ben Desai led the Grunwick strike a couple of years after working there. What was it that finally made her walk out? Was there any one last straw? There were a whole range of issues that had been building up around pay and conditions. And on this particular day, on 20th August 1976, there had been an incident earlier in the day where one of the workers had been sacked for working being too slow. There was a second incident where Jabin Desai's son worked in the factory and he was fooling around with a friend of his. They were students and they worked out in the summer and he was giggling and the manager turned to him and said, stop behaving like monkeys, this isn't a zoo. And the term monkeys has a very racial connotation as well. You know, she would have been very upset by that. So later in the day, and so at six o'clock as she was packing up to leave for home, the manager turned to her and said, you've got to stay back for an overtime. And for a woman, that's difficult because she had to go back home and do a second shift of work, cooking and cleaning. And as I understand it, the conditions at Grunwick's were that you didn't have to agree to overtime in advance. It was assumed that you must do overtime whenever you were told And you could be told at the last minute like that. At six o'clock and you were expected to stay on till nine or ten o'clock at night. So she refused. She had had enough. And she walked out. And as she went 
past the workers she turned to them and said he wouldn't treat white workers the way he treats us so she was acutely conscious right from the beginning that this was about race you're listening to great lives on bbc radio 4 with me matthew paris my guest is aisha hazarika whose great life is jaya ben desai and we're also joined by our expert witness dr sundari anita do you think aisha that it was at that moment she d- decided to go on strike or did she just storm out in a an uncontrollable rage and then afterwards think about striking i think she just snapped i think yeah. she just had enough and just thought you know as as a human being i've been tested to the limit particularly because her son had been involved early in that day and i think she probably didn't in her mind think ah i'm going to mastermind this huge piece of industrial action how did she liaise with the other workers anita and she'd been sacked after all she couldn't go back to work no so the next day the workers drafted a petition with their complaints and as others were coming into the factory they got them to sign and soon more than 100 workers joined them and left the factory and so it grew very quickly through word of mouth and because there was already a discontent brewing in the factory for a long time and what was the union that they joined because she won't have known what ropes to to go through will she for joining a trade union absolutely so the tuc advised them to join a white collar union called apex and they got paid strike money which they i mean i don't know how they would have survived otherwise and they formed a strike committee and they started mobilizing and going round the country but it was a few months before the support really took off and for the first few months through that winter of 1976 they stood alone a f- group of w- women workers picketing outside the grunwick factory and jabin desai and other workers recalled people who went past them hurtling racist abuse at them pakis go back to pakilan and so there was a period when it was a very lonely vigil to support. I mean, I've seen a little bit of footage of somebody saying that, you know, really offensive using the p word. And what struck me is there is no fear from Jaben and this is what incredible she just hits back no this is my country to you go away and it's this yeah. fearless she's very brilliantly assertive and she's not having it she's confrontational and you know i think for me that's incredibly powerful and i can see why a lot of these trade union men were really inspired by her because it's rare to see that amount of fight from somebody you know it was incredible but it was that going out reaching out to other trade unions and the speeches she gave were really well received we are here to ask you to put pressure on tlc to cut off vital services to george ward and to support the resumption of mass picketing which we do not want to do but we have no other alternatives did she get immediate support from community family um in the beginning there was a lot of resistance within her own community jaben went from door to door talking to husbands to fathers trying to persuade them to let women in the family join the strike how about his, her husband oh he was very supportive though on the very first day when she went back home and told him what she'd done he was alarmed he said our house could be set on fire what if our children get kidnapped he didn't know where this would end and she says i turned to him and said don't worry i haven't done it just for myself i've done it for everyone and i'll take care of it and she says he completely supported her after that and did she get a lot of pushback from particularly the men in the community were they sort of angry did they feel that they were she was kind of turning their wives into sort of subversive um kind of angry women there was some resistance there were some young women who were pressurized to go back to the factory and jabin also uh, told me about a phone call she received from a woman she thought it was a, some george ward from grunwick had uh, set this up so a woman called up uh, her home and told her husband that i've seen your wife talking to strange men and laughing and behaving inappropriately when she goes out because she was leaving the home and going on these trips to other cities to give speeches and she says her husband shouted to the woman on the phone and slammed the phone down and she's very proud about the fact that he supported her and george ward was playing on the sense of shame and and control that a man is expected to have over his wife to restrain her wow so it's it's literally every element of the patriarchy yeah. isn't it shame, it really is shame yeah smearing that stuff. and coming together yeah when and how did this become turn into the mass protest that that it it finally became 
in the summer of 1977, so through June, there was a huge mobilization and there were several mass pickets. And we're talking about up to 20,000 people packed into the narrow streets around North London. And this country had 20, never 20,000 mm. had never seen something like that. And through that whole summer, there were several big pickets and demonstrations. There was a special patrol group used for, for, for the very first time to deal with this, wasn't there? Yeah. So the Grunwick dispute made history for several reasons, not just the number of people who turned up to support migrant women workers, but also because this was a moment when the special patrol group was deployed in a domestic industrial dispute for the first time in this country. And this was almost like a rehearsal for what happened in the miners' strike. And that was extraordinary. That's that's exactly my interpretation of it. It felt like when you look back historically... Grunwick was a sort of precursor to the miners' strike. And definitely you get the sense that Margaret Thatcher is very shaped by what happened at Grunwick and the the nightly news reports of seeing this kind of terrible violence and insubordination. And I think she obviously is shaped watching Grunwick thinks, right, if this ever happens, I know which side I'm going to take. And it's certainly not with the workers. I was working in Margaret Thatcher's office at that time, I can't remember there was any support from the Conservative Party, quite the opposite. But in power at the time was a Labour government under Prime Minister James Callaghan. Were they sympathetic, Aisha? No, I don't think they were sympathetic enough at all. And I think that was um, something that people were very surprised about at the time. The MPs that that went and supported it, well, the, the famous name is Shirley Williams. I think the Labour government didn't really know how to handle it. I think they didn't know what to do. The Home Secretary was Merlin Rees. Yes. He, I think, panicked and insisted that there had to be a heavy police presence. There were reports that he went down and he wanted to try and, you know, give a sense of calm, but everybody was jeering him and and sort of booing him. So I think where the Labour government ended up was trying to negotiate a public inquiry into what happened. Which with, did happen, didn't With it? Lord yeah. Scarman. But the problem with that is that Jayabin very wisely predicted that the bosses at Grunwick would not adhere to the findings of that report. And that report found in favour of the workers, said that they should have their jobs back, there should be trade union recognition, but the bosses at Grunwick just ignored it. And at this point, and I... I... I can't quite understand this. At this point, the trade unions abandoned her. They did. And we know now from declassified documents uh, from the special branch files that there were discussions between the government, James Callaghan, who put pressure on on Home Secretary to mobilise the police to proactively police the Grunwick dispute. And the media was projecting the Grunwick dispute as a public order issue. And therefore, there was a lot of pressure from the government on the trade unions of the day to withdraw their support. And the whole Scarman report was a move towards bureaucratisation of the dispute. What would be your response to the argument that it had actually become a public order issue? Well, it definitely did become a public order issue. There was one particularly brutal day in November 1977 when, you know, there was a huge amount of violence. But I think the problem is, is when the police become very, very heavy-handed in a situation like that, tempers are up the blood is up with everybody. Yeah. It's a tinderbox situation and the whole thing just escalates. I've been I mean, looking at uh, some video material. that The police certainly were very heavy-handed. On the other hand, you did get the impression that there was a kind of pretty good scrap on all sides. The media didn't cover the police violence and the media mm. almost completely focused on the so-called violence from the picketers. I mean, we have incidents where the uh, Grunwick strikers were beaten up, were found beaten up, and on the day of a woman's picket, women were dragged by their hair by the mm. police. And we now have visual evidence and we know from declassified documents that this police violence did take place. But at that point, the media was completely silenced about this. And, and I would also problem. argue that, you know, look, there's always a bit of you know spin and who's what side is the media spinning the initial optic of this tiny woman in a sari faced with big burly policemen is not a good look for the government of the day it's not a good look for the establishment it's not a good look for grunwick so why didn't she get more media support but in a way it's easier to show the narrative of actually it's all hooligans it's everybody out of control they're thugs this that the next thing it's easier to take the narrative down oh it's you know they're badly behaved 
rude, it's all violent, to take away from the fundamental issue of why the strike started, which was about dignity at work and basic human rights. Yes, I'm just viewing it as we saw it as members of the public. And I I just put it to you that the way the cause was taken up by the left, including the fairly hard left, Arthur Scargill, people like that. I've been watching a documentary about it all in which Jeremy Corbyn gives his views with a Nicaraguan Sandinista poster as his his chosen backdrop, that, that that may unwittingly have worked against these rather unpolitical women who are not hard left or hard right or or anything, but got themselves sort of caught up in something with some rather unsavoury elements. I think in order to achieve their rights, they had to make it public. They had to mobilise support from the rest of the trade unions because previously when women had tried to uh, struggle for their rights, without that kind of public visibility, nothing had come about. Mm. And so it's only through that mobilisation of other trade unions that the Grunwick dispute went as far as it did. So they damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. I think and it's an unfair deal. Look, I've been critical of Jeremy Corbyn, but I think it's good that he was somebody who took part in that and showed well, he was solidarity. On the right, he was on the right side. He was on, on the right side. And I think it's important to remember who the villains of the peace were, and they were the bosses at Grunwick. And remember, part of the reason why things escalated to these massive strikes was that every time an opportunity was provided for more conciliation or mediation, like with ACAS, it was rejected by the bosses of Grunwick. In a way, they kept ramping up the fight, thinking, oh, these Indian women will back down, surely. And they didn't. Did the factory, did they manage to keep going? They managed to keep going. They refused to acknowledge the Scarman report. Uh, and the management then refused to acknowledge the report. Why didn't the government back Jaya Ben at that point? Well, I agree with you. I think it was um, a terrible dereliction of, of duty. And actually, if you look at the sort of rule of law, if the government says something mm. is going to go, why should you as an individual employer just say, actually, I'm above the law. I'm above you know, what's been recommended. But I just think the Grunwick strike became, it was put in the too difficult to handle box and nobody quite knew where to go with it how she managed to keep going how she managed with that resilience when everybody could see that it was probably running out of road is incredible in the end she had to fold though didn't she yeah but she didn't go quietly (laughs) um so when she realized that her trade union was turning against her under pressure from the labor government of the day She and three other strikers went on a hunger strike, and this is a tradition from the Indian Freedom Movement, um, went on a hunger strike outside the TUC headquarters. And it was quite an ironic moment that these workers who'd been struggling for the right to join a trade union were now protesting against their own trade union. They had their membership withdrawn from the trade union for that act of protest. You're right. And actually, that's one of the things that I feel quite heartbroken about, because I wanted this story to have a happy ending, like the Dagenham women, and they didn't have a happy ending. She was betrayed by everybody, in a way, by the trade union movement, by everybody. She was. And I think for her, what must have been like an absolute punch in the stomach was when Apex and the Trade Union Congress sort of sold her down the river and said, right, we're not carrying on with this strike. She must have felt so disillusioned. And she, she was very poetic, actually, in her language. She thought her English wasn't very good, but she, she spoke with great passion and she said, trade union support is like honey on the elbow. You can smell it, you can feel it, but you cannot taste it. And she felt very um, abandoned by that. They didn't have this happy ending. You couldn't make a sort of jazz hands film about it like they did with uh, Made in Dagenham. But here's what she did achieve. She secured better rights for future workers at Grunwick, things like basic human rights, pensions, things like that. Her action did change the course of industrial relations for the worse and then, I think, for the better. But most importantly... She taught the trade union movement an important lesson. Rights have got to be for all workers. It's not just about white men. It's women, it's people of colour and it's immigrant workers as well. We're coming near the end of our discussion, but I'd like to make a a personal comment. As you've described this conflict, both of you and the character of Jaya Ben Desai, I felt myself totally on her side. I, I can remember the episode. I hardly recognise the story as it seemed to some of us Conservatives then, at the time. Also, to have your perspective, because you were in the room, as it were, on the other side. Yeah, we only saw the violence on the picket lines. I don't think we saw 
we never saw those women properly. We, I mean, we knew who they were, but I don't think we ever asked ourselves about them. We asked about violent secondary picketing. Yeah. And in many ways, the image of the dispute and the, when you look at photographs, it's about a very um, masculine trade union movement, all, mm. of, all, all of the men on the picket line. And I think it's the voices of the women that have been written out of history. Yes. Yeah. And for us, it was really important to talk to the women to get their stories and their, uh, get their account of what happened and what it meant to them. Maybe in one, one of the reasons they've been a bit written out and, and, and she's been a bit written out is that none of the big organisations come out of this very well. Obviously not the Conservative Party, not the Labour Party, not the trade union movement. So who is there really to uh, to celebrate what, what she did? And it's a tricky celebration, isn't it? While you want to remember something unique happened, it's also laced with lessons for mm. all of these big agent organisations. Mm. What happened to George Ward and his company? He carried on and through the Grunwick dispute, he increased the wages and uh, the conditions at Grunwick became better because of the spotlight that was shining on him. And what happened to Jayaban? Jayaban went on to teach a course in Harrow College on Asian dressmaking. Whenever there was an anniversary of Grunwick, people would reach out for her and to hear her voice again. Do you think she felt she'd failed? My sense of sadness about her life is she was clearly incredibly intelligent, hugely spirited, brave political with the best of intentions as well, not political for herself, political for others. I wish that she could have done more in the sphere of either the trade union movement or party politics. She had a very positive account of her life. She looked back and her account was of her life lived well. And when she talked about the Grunwick dispute, it was the, the strike failed, but in her mind, the struggle carried on. So I think she had a sense of the larger picture and the larger struggle that she was part of and how later victories can only be built upon earlier failures. Uh, well, I, that gladdens my heart because, I, you know, I, that's certainly what I feel. I feel she has shaped in a very profound way industrial relations in this country. And I think as well, her bravery and the message that she sent out is just so important for where we are right now. There is a strong anti-immigrant rhetoric. There's a lot of that narrative. People even say, I haven't heard this in years, go back to where you came from. And I do say I'm from Glasgow originally. But, you know, I think that it's a really strong reminder that, you know, the trade union movement and the left and progressive politics has not got to be about a hierarchy of rights. It's got to be about rights for everybody. You'd have loved to have been on the picket line with her, wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aisha Hazarika, for setting the record straight. And thanks to our expert, Dr Sundari Anita. Goodbye. <laughs>